From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Hi, and welcome to another John Hannam Meets. Today, we're going to celebrate the life of Jim Bowen, who died in early 2018. I interviewed Jim numerous times during his career, and today we're going back to 2006, when I met him at the Warner's Bembridge Coast Hotel on the Isle of Wight. Another Hannum Archive. Great to welcome back Jim Bowen to the Isle of Wight and John Hannum It's Nice to see you again, Jim. Hi, John. All right. You've been here a few times in your life, haven't you? Yep, just a few. Yeah. And you enjoy coming away from England, don't you? I think so. I think it's, it's nice. You sort of feel like you're going on holiday, whatever the weather, because you've got that, uh, that, that subliminal break where the water separates you from the mainland. So I think psychologically you're on holiday, yeah, maybe. And it's, it's a lovely island, isn't it? Wonderful. Now, these days... Things have all changed. It's all celebrity-led now, but mm. you're what I call a real legend because you've been going for <laughs> over, th- over 30 years yes, and absolutely. you're now revered by students, universities. And well, you're... it would seem so. It's very flattering you should say that. But, yes, it does appear that the game that I presented so ineptly for 15 years has taken off again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I believe you're an agony aunt, is that right? Well, I do the... Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> it's, it's Uncle Jim's problem page <laughs> for the University of Central Lancashire. <laughs> oh, get some bizarre letters. <laughs> Very funny. I've enjoyed doing it. Can I ask you a few things later when we're off air? Could you help me or not, really? Well, I think... I've been looking at you this morning, John. I think you're beyond help. <laughs> 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 I, think, I think you've just better get on with it the way you are. <laughs> Your story fascinates me because I know you almost became a head teacher, you could have done, but you were a dustbin man, labourer, driver. Mm. What a mixed beginning you had, Jim, didn't you, really? Yeah, I was I was jack of all trades and, and a master of not, not, not even a little bit of any of them. I was looking for answers, really. I left school, failed all my GCEs and did, as you say, the dustbins in a place called Paddyham near Burnley in Lanks. And then uh, went back to school, took all the GCEs again. He put me back in the fifth form, did the head. Well, I was 17, in with 14-year-olds. He made me drop two years and take the whole year again. But it paid off because I worked then and then went off, did national service, fought for my country in Shrewsbury, <laughs> kept the Welsh out. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, I went to train as a school teacher, yeah. And then it was school teaching until 69, from yeah. 59, did 10 years. Met Phyllis, my wife, uh, when she was training at Liverpool. Uh, got married 59, taught for 10 years, and then the comedians came along. It's a bit like Tom O'Connor, really. I know you had Tom on. It. Yes. A, a lovely man. Um, and Tom, Tom and I, our, our paths were, were not dissimilar. Tom was a school teacher, deputy head, in fact, as was I. Uh, and then Tom, he was slightly bigger than me, he was Tom at the time, uh, in profile, as it were. When you get to our age, profile doesn't matter. Getting out of bed's important now. <laughs> uh, but Tom was a big star in the 70s. Mm. Thames, big night out, and he was there. He was their prime presenter. Um, I did the comedians in 1970. I've been doing the club semi-pro at the same time as teaching. You were getting about seven quid a night, were you? Something well, like on that. a good night, yeah. Yes. I got paid off most nights. <laughs> yeah. But we learnt, learnt our craft there. We, a lot of us did. Tom did, I did. Uh, and uh, Well, we all did in the clubs. That's where we learnt it. We didn't all go in there from school teaching, though it's interesting to note one or two comedians were school teachers. Um, and then the comedians came along and we did that, and it was just an accountancy decision, really. We just said, no, what's the point of school teaching now when you could pick, you know, if you've been on telly in 1970, your money suddenly went to, you went to like 25 quid a night, which was a lot of money. Mm. And I was glad to get out of teaching then because they'd stopped us chaining the little buggers to the desks. <laughs> so it was, yeah. you, you know what I'm saying, I mean, we had yeah. a bit of discipline then. There wasn't, but now it's, I, I feel very sorry for school teachers now. I couldn't do it now. No, I don't, I think... When you know school teachers and you see what they go through and what they've got to do, it's, yeah. I don't yeah. know how they cope, really. Yeah. And the police. Everything. This is one of the joys of the island, I think. I think this, this strip of water, it, it, it is now for safety net for you, really. Frank Carson was here the other night, and oh, I'm pretty God. certain he, he walked into a club when you were working. Is that right? Did he sort of spot oh, you? Oh, or? yes, he did. Yeah. Oh, yes, he did. Frank was lovely to me. I was doing a club in 1969. I was there for six nights, two spots a night. I started the Monday night through to the Saturday. 
and uh, every spot I died, every one. First and second, Monday night, first and second, Tuesday night, first and second, Wednesday night, Thursday night, I'd lost the will to live. And I went in to do the first spot. Same club, same compare, same sound system, same band, same everything. And for some unaccountable reason, I tore the place to pieces. And I came off, went to the bar at the interval, and Frank was there. And Frank said, yeah, you're a funny man, he said. I'm in television. And of course, Frank was quite famous then, you know. Yes. Uh, in Ireland, he was massive. But I, I mean, a wonderful man. I mean, he's a man and a half. And Frank said, do you want to go on television? That's like saying, is the Pope a Catholic? <laughs> in 1970, with only two channels to get on yeah. television. It was phenomenal. Yeah. And for 18 months later, the phone rang. It was Johnny Hamp, who found the comedians. And he said, and Frank, true to his word, had told Johnny Hamp. Uh, and so really, it's all down to Frank. Isn't it? Brilliant show for comics, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, tremendous. It wasn't very good for material because it gobbled it up yes. phenomenally quickly. But the good news is, of course, Frank's still doing the same act as he was doing in 1966. <laughs> the joyful public have <laughs> limited <laughs> retentive powers, <laughs> which is as well for Frank. Well, and me for that matter, because the stuff I'm doing is, is very old, but I like to think it's still fairly solid, you know. I think when you went back to do Muck and Brass, that was sort of going back to your roots in a way, well, wasn't in, it? In a way it was, but again, that was quite bizarre. I was doing This was before Bullseye. Somebody had seen me somewhere, I don't know where. And they, and they said, do you want to be in a, a film series? And it was with Mel Smith. It was a serious drama about council corruption. Uh, and I, I did eventually. And I'll tell you what I got. I got a 1,000 quid for two episodes, but it was like 10 days filming. It was all on film, you see. You do 10 mm. seconds and then mm. do a relight and do... Uh, and I played the part, the part of a bent accountant, as in Crooked, rather than Hello, Dolly. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't think it did my career any harm it didn't enhance it at all but it was certainly something I, I'm glad I did mm. it started me on the film bit and, and then I've done bits of well I've done well we've done you'll come to it anyway I suppose we've done um, Last of the Summer Wine a few yes. of those yeah. which was lovely yeah. I, and a thing with I did a thing with Diane Keane called Foxy Lady it was about a printing company with a guy called, and I've started this conversation now, John, and, I, and I'm not going to finish it. Oh, all right. <laughs> he was a very funny man, and his name will come to me, Tom Menhard. Tom, Tom Menhard. Menhard. Yeah, I remember him. What a funny man. Yeah. And he was in this film. This, because a lot of comics do acting. It's amazing, mm. isn't it? Mm. The number of comedians. Because, mm. I mean, basically all you're doing is, is when you go on stage, you, you, basically you're acting. I mean, if the check's big enough, I'll cry. It's timing, isn't it, as well? It's about timing and being yeah. aware, of, being aware of, 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 of what you're delivering yeah and i think it, when you get to 60 up the chances are you're getting most of that right if you're not you're in the wrong job and this business does have a nasty habit of finding you out mm. so yeah i don't have a problem acting i always think terrible to say this really but i think acting is easy that's an awfully generic thing to say but but i do think it is i think if you read the part if you if you're in the business of projecting and, and selling mm. yourself mm. you can act mm. You can act. Mm. The number of comics who have become great actors. Look at Arthur English, he became great, didn't Arthur he? Arthur became great. And there's Shane Richards in film, and, yeah. and Shane was a comedian. Um, I mean, you can go on and on and on. Yeah. A lot of comics who, who, who went into film. Russ Abbott mm. the, and Les Dennis. Mm. All, it's funny how Russ and Les always, they wanted to be actors, and there's no money in it. Crazy. They get, like, I don't, 300 quid a week acting. I know. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Bullseye, amazing, really. Fifteen years was it, at least, wasn't it? Oh yeah. Yes. I, it, it's it's all it was all an accident. Looking back at the whole career, John, it's been an accident. The whole thing. And I've got a I've got a book out. I did an autobiography called Right Place, Right Time. The second one I did. I did one in '93, and I thought, well, the business has been good enough to to me now for me to tell the story. And then suddenly, another ten years is added, with bonuses. So I wrote another one in 2003, which is the same book, tweaked and, and ten years added, plus a few cheeky stories at the end. Not naughty ones, but cheeky ones, funny ones. Um, and it's right place, right? And it is that. And the whole business is, is... Anybody who says, I've got here because I'm, I'm exclusively talented and blah, 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 don't do business with them because they're telling lies. You need to be in the right place at the right time. You really do. It all fell into your, really, because you had the catchphrases too, didn't you? But we, you see, the funny thing, John, we... We never, we, did, we didn't know we were creating these catchphrases. No. You know, the, the big one is look at what you could have won. <laughs> I mean, I'll, you can't have a more sadistic phrase in, in show business than that. Look at, there you are, look at what you could have gone on with. It's vicious, isn't it? Yeah. But how do you tell somebody that, 
Um, how else can you say it? And the bully thing next came and by. The rubber ball, the little bendy ball that came along by, by accident. My director, a wonderful man called Peter Harris, said, I think we should have a little bendy pig, a bendy toy. I said, what for? He said, well, we should have a bull, bully, he said. And make, give him a big tummy like the dart player. <laughs> I said, you're crazy, man, it's, it's a darts game. And they become, they became, people wanted those more than the prizes. Quite bizarre. <laughs> the whole thing was a series of accidents. In the early days, Jim, you, there was a guy in the Daily Mirror called Hilary Kingston, I think, who tore you off. Kingsley, Kingsley yeah, was you it? Have yeah. got, you have got your facts there, haven't you? <laughs> I'll, say, I'll tell you what she said. Yes. You'll have it down there, I reckon. <laughs> she said in the Daily Mirror one Saturday, she said, uh, what is this illiterate, innumerate, geriatric doing on our television screens? And, of course, she was nearly right because <laughs> I was very, very poor. I, I think it was, it was slightly vitriolic. <laughs> put it, did I tell you the story about when I went out that night? No. Well, when we read it on the Saturday morning, Phyllis said, oh, the, the news agent around me said, look, he said, I don't think you should read this, the, the Daily Mirror today. It was a Saturday in the, in the village where we live and, incidentally, still live next to. Um, he said, uh, don't get the, the Mirror. I said, so I was down straight away, wasn't I, to get one? Yeah. And I read it this half page. And I went back, I was destroyed. It was the first series. And I was absolutely destroyed. And Phyllis said, I said, why am I in this business? I said, we get a chance to do a game show, which is Manor from Heaven. Nobody got game shows in the 80s. They were like gold dust. And they, yeah. he and I got a prime time. And I was... And Phyllis said, look, she said, you'll have to get on me. And that was the first time I had to come face to face with higher profile and, and all the entrapments that go with it. Um, so I went out that night. I said to Phyllis, I'm just going to have a beer on me. And I went down to the middle of the telly, Morecambe to have a beer. And I went into the little, the little cocktail bar and I, I ordered a half a bitter and I heard a voice from behind me. He said, hello, sunshine, how are you doing? And the voice I knew, the man I'd never met, Eric Morecambe, because he lived in Morecambe, real right. name, Eric Bartholomew. He'd gone back to see his mum and dad. So I turned and he said, I saw the mirror this morning, sunshine. I thought, oh God, this is the most popular man in Britain and he's read about me. He said, come on, have a sit down. I went and sat with him, and he was wonderful. He said, because uh, I was in awe of the man. I mean, the man yeah. was, even then, was a legend. I mean, mm. come wise, even then, mm. we're coming out with the Christmas specials, and, you know, I'm, phew, they were big. And, uh, and I sat down next to him, he said, uh, I said, it wasn't very nice, was it, that sunshine? And then he said, let me tell you something, he said. Let me give you a piece of advice, he said. He said, the most difficult thing to find in anybody's household is yesterday's newspaper. Isn't that nice? And yes. it just suddenly all dropped into place. <laughs> he said, tomorrow, somebody else will be in that space, and you've gone. So I thought, that's the way to handle it. No. So the deal is, you don't read any of your crits. The deal is, if you're not going to read the bad ones, then you mustn't read the good ones. Or conversely, if you're going to read the bad, read the good. So I tend not to bother. I did, uh, when I did the Edinburgh Festival last year. Uh, I was the only performer there with a bus pass. All the others were 25, 30 year old comedic blades who were coming in trying to force their way into the business and, and it was wonderful to be part of it. I went up there because it didn't matter. It was the fringe, all young creative forces. And I did jonglers for 21 nights. What I'm doing here tonight, it's not stand up tonight, it's just an evening with. And I just do an hour with them, talking to them about the start, the adoption, the bump, all of it. Tell them interspersed with stories about Les Dawson, all the guys we work with. And I did this, and I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the response. We went until at seven o'clock every night, and it packed, sold out every night. Uh, but the eclectic mix of the audience, there they were 80-year-olds sitting with 17-year-old students. They had a coffee to the 80-year-olds, and the lads, the students were having pints of lager. And the atmosphere was phenomenal. It just, it, it just heightened the appeal of the programme, I suppose. Hi, Joe Blanche, it's Nick Frisbee here saying John Hannum is a puppet. At least 12 million used to watch balls like every week, yeah, didn't they? they did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's remarkable, wasn't it? Yeah. And they used to take the mick about the prizes, oh, but they no, weren't they... that bad, were they? Well, I don't know. They... Uh, yes, <laughs> were they? they were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, they were, uh, we, I used to say, well, in fact, I do it now, but some of the prize descriptions. Uh, you can stop your grumbling when your washer will be tumbling. Uh, something else is rumbling <laughs> in the spin dryer, <laughs> something like that. And the other one was, uh, uh, wake up. This will stop you yawning as the new day's dawning. 
It's a coffee tea, a coffee tea, a, ca- a coffee pot. <laughs> <laughs> we did all these at the Edinburgh Festival. The send up to the prizes, and they used to say they'd win a toaster, you know. They win, a- and if they were really good, we'd put a plug on it. I mean, <laughs> that was how bad it was. But you've got to remember, in 1980, to win a car, in 1980, that was a fair old prize, you mm. know. Mm. We used to give them protons. And uh, what else did we? Oh, we had Ford Fiesta 1.1, Popular Plus, the basic Ford. Because Pete Harris, the director, he had 7,000 quid for all the prizes, for the whole show. That's with first, seconds and thirds, the prize board and the star prize. He'd go out shopping and for prizes. He used to go to Curry's and barter them down. Did he? Oh, yeah, yeah, he did. We, he had a buyer and they used to go out. Harris was a really hands-on man. He was a programme maker, was Harris. Wonderful guy. And he, I, think he, I think he read a lot of Judy Garland books and watched the Judy Garland films, you know, and wore socks. Pink socks and that. He's a lovely guy. And he said, we're over budget again, he said, on this programme. I'm going to have to go out and do some shopping. It's what a great guy. He's still alive. Still a dear friend. Did you like... Because everybody knew you, didn't they? Everywhere you went, people knew oh, you. Yeah. Could you cope with that? It was OK? Well, it was, at first, it, it took a bit of coping with. Uh, but it took two or three years, you know, for it to actually take off. In the first series, we lost five million viewers in the first 13 weeks. It was Monday night, the first series. And we followed Crossroads. Which, was, which had 11 million, uh, into Coronation Street at 7.30, which picked up 13 million. And we came in inheriting 11 million on Monday nights, and five weeks in, we were down to 5 million. We just lost the network completely because people, I don't know what it was. And then they, suddenly, in the last seven or eight shows, the, the figures went up again. And I, th- I worked it out. I think what they used to do, they used to watch it on the Monday night and go to the pub. And they said, did you see that tonight with Bowen? Have you ever seen anything that's bad? And they'd, and they'd say, it's got to get better. <laughs> And it never did. <laughs> so I think it beggared quality. Um, but it was lovely. And then they gave us Sunday nights and the rest is history. Mm. It just took that slot and it became it became ours. You did the World Tappers a few times. Was that, was that anything like a real club? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Johnny Hamp, same producer, wonderful yeah. man. Found us all. And Johnny built a working men's club in the studio, in Studio 6 at Granada. Did it happen, you know, when... Had the bell. Colin we, had the yeah, bell. They, and he used to say things like, he used to, I'll do it for you for sound effect. He used to tap the microphone... Give order, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All the way around the room. (laughs) Pies have come. They've come on their own. (laughs) Next week's turn is nailed up on the door. (laughs) And then he said, uh, uh, now it's come to my attention, listen, the notice outside the gents, wet paint, this is not an instruction. (laughs) (laughs) Colin used to do all these. Sadly, he was one of the first to die, was Colin. Yeah, he was, yeah. Yeah. But were they chairman like that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, they were. Yeah. In fact, there's a lovely comic I'm sure you've interviewed him, John, called Norman Collier. Yes, very much. Whoa, yeah. the man's crazy. Yeah, he's a comics comic, isn't oh, he? Oh, yes. Yeah. Bob Munkass once said to me, I'm, I'm privileged to say that Bob Munkass was a dear friend. In fact, he did the foreword to the autobiography. A dear friend. And he was very good to me at the beginning. And he said, there's two kinds of comedian. There's a man who tells funny stories and a funny man who tells stories. And... And uh, Norman was a funny man. Mm. Cooper was a funny man. Mm. I think Bob would be the first to admit he was a man who told funny stories. Mm. Bob could deliver, but Cooper didn't need to deliver, did he? No. I mean, I talk about Cooper tonight here, and uh, I tell him a couple of stories about Royal Command performances, and, and, and they will fall about. When he did a summer over here, two or three weeks, he just he had a gate on, on he the stage. Walk the he just walked through no, the gate. No fence either side, just a gate. <laughs> That's it. Said, What's all that? <laughs> every, every time. Said, why, why do you do that? What's all that about? What's all that about? He said, uh, there's a lovely story about... Do you know the one about when he was on guard? No. And it, well, he was six feet six, you know. Yes. With a fez on, he, he was a block of flats. Yeah. And uh, he was in the Welsh Guards. And he was guarding Windsor Castle. Well, one of the guards, obviously. At least it's all cosmetic, we know, but he had the rifle. And he fell asleep, standing up. And it, he was awoken by the, the sound of the footsteps of the Sergeant Major coming out. I thought, God, I'm... I'm asleep. A sergeant major came out, and just before he spoke, he opened his eyes and went, "Amen." <laughs> Tommy been saying his prayers. Yeah. It's a lovely story. Some lovely stories about Tommy. You did Phoenix Nights too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Yes, loved it. <laughs> loved it. He's popular, isn't he, Peter Kay? Massive. Is he massive. one of the newer breed? You think that's he's, really top? I think he's the only one in the last decade that's bridged the gap between old style and, and 21st century. Mm. He's doing. You'll be old enough, John, and I say that with great respect. To remember, I'll read on radio. Oh, I should say. I, know, yeah. I think Peter Kay is the visual. I'll read. Yeah. I'll uh, read was on on. Uh, he was on radio, wasn't he? Mm. And uh, he, he had the story about the, you know the fellow going to visit it, going to visit, come in, come in, sit down. 
<laughs> you won't yeah. bite, you sit down. Yeah. And the fellow's going, I'll, I'll, I'll. sit still, he's got all your leg now. If you're all right, keep, just sit still, uh, don't move. <laughs> he's, he's tearing your trouser leg now. Uh, well, that shows he likes you, all that. Yeah. Did he go you said, uh, j- 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 just a minute or something like that? Uh, j- 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 is that right? J- j- just a minute, and then they do the one that, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's the wife from the kitchen. Yes. <laughs> do you remember all that? <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful stuff. <laughs> and that, but you see, Al never, t- never translated to, to, to the visual because he was so good at the theatre of the mind, which is a one... I mean, this is a tremendous medium, this you and I are in now. I mean, I love this because you can just... You can play with it, can't you? And you Henri was wonderful. Yeah, too. you used to do Radio Lancashire. I did Radio yeah. Lancs for three years. Yeah. I did it, a live programme, every morning, 9 till 12, with Sally Naden, a wonderful presenter. She was fabulous. And the two of us did it. And do you know what we used, we used to do? Juggling in the ring. <laughs> Yes. We're not, not only juggling, but juggling with silk scarves. <laughs> so you couldn't hear anything. And we, had the, <laughs> we used to, I said to Sally, pick the scarves up. And uh, I said, right. now you're listening at home. Listen, she just, three scarves. She's got, there's a red one, a white one, and a blue one. Go on, Sal, off you go. And I used to go. <laughs> <laughs> and the listeners used to ring in, listen to this. And they say, we love the juggling. We loved it this morning. And then we some of the stuff we did. It was a, we, the, the happiest three years of my life, I think, when I was on BBC <laughs> radio. It was lovely. Do you miss those big shows like, I don't know, Summertime Special, Starburst, where, you know, people had a, a chance to be in real variety think, on TV, didn't they? I think people in show business miss it even yeah. more than the public. Yeah. And I think the public... You see, we've got here now at Bembridge, and Warners have actually got it absolutely right, I think. There are a lot of us, Touchwood, living, living longer. Mm. And, and the average age here will be... It, It'll probably reach door figures, you know. The, the average year could be over 12. Yes. In fact, I think it's probably approaching three. But, <laughs> but it doesn't matter because they're, they're here, they're happy, they're lively, they're animated. And there's not, not as much on television for them now as there ought to be because they're taking up at least 25% of, of, of our nation. And they, they feel neglected. And I think this is where Warners have it. That they're offering them a chance. Tonight, there was a lovely girl on last night. Uh, the, the advertised lady couldn't appear because she was heavily pregnant and she was frightened about the weather last night because it was really mm. and the fairies and bumping about this other girl came in and she was lovely she did 40 minutes singing Dusty Springfield uh, Abba um, can't think can't remember the others but it doesn't matter they were all songs that they could they could relate to and it was just a joy to see 300 people enjoying a cabaret act because it's the only place they can see it mm. when you see a lady having a 10 minute slot on television the music's very much pop orientated. You never see it on, on television now. And there's a place for it, I'm sure. Just half hour, a big band show, the Billy Cotton show, mm. with a big band and a couple of good singers and a, a nice steady comic in the middle just comparing it. Mm. Just half an hour. Mm. Don't give them the hour, it might be too much. But I think I think 30 minutes they could live with. Are, you, in, are you into reality shows, the no, junk, no, jungle no, shows and all those? No. I was offered a fortune to go on, on I'm a Celebrity. Were you? I was offered a fortune to do the kitchen with, with, with what's his name? Yes. The cook. Crazy yes. Crazy cook. I'm not into cooks. I don't know no, much I'm about not, them. I'm not. Uh, oh, no. But I, having said that, you know, and the X Factor, which is the, it's, it's similar to Opportunity Knox, in a way. It's mm. become much more commercialised and it spreads over a longer period and it takes more airtime. But it's young orientated. Now, I have nothing against that at all. But we could have all been there. But I just think maybe there's a, there's a chance to say, look, why don't we just give it an hour, an hour a night? To, let's just pander to the 25% mm. who are being missed out a little mm. bit, I think. How do you think it's going to change? Do you think it's going to keep on this? Or do you think sort of different entertainment will come back? What do you think might happen? I tend to think things... Um, this, is not, this is not a very educated outlook at it, but I think, and certainly not a well-informed one, but my gut feeling is that things go in circles. And, and I just got the tip of it turning again when I did The Fringe. Yeah. Because I went on and did a very traditional... It wasn't stand-up, as I said. It was a, It was just a chat. It was a joy to do. And the audiences were incredible. And I, I thought, God, this is vaudeville. We're back to burlesque here. I, I was telling stories about Cooper, about Les Dawson, about stories about Bullseye. And it, and, and it was it was nearly stand-up. But it was, oh, it was Max Miller again. Come here, lady. Come oh, here. Yeah. Hey, not many of us left, are there? <laughs> All that kind of thing. It was having an, a, an affair with the audience again. See, the modern comedians, and this is not to knock them in any way, because uh, it, would be, it would be crass of us to do that, because they're trying to create, at least they're creating, 
See, in 1970, when we did the, we just pinched gags. We weren't creative. We didn't try and do. There was nothing clever about what we did. Uh, we just, well, that's a good gag. I'll try. I'll put that in next week when he's not here. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. You know, yes. Tom was one of the first to do it. Tom O'Connor started doing the, the Al Ree bit. Mm. Peter Kerr's doing it now, 30 years on. Mm. But he's in a more, a more technically more advanced arena, so he can do more. They can show more. They can get the detail better. Um, and but you see, most of the comic, they're slightly intellectual. You see, I believe if you've got to think about a line, even for a millisecond, the moment's gone. Cooper walking through the gate. Yes. That's it. Bump. And yeah. it's gone. If if he were to leave, and some of the stuff Cooper did, he said, bottle, glass, glass bottle, yeah. bottle, and the bottle of the pit, bottle, offside again. Thank you very much. <laughs> you laugh at that at the, at the instant rather than a second after the yeah. line's been delivered. Yeah. Once you've got to think about the comedy, it's not comedy, it, it becomes an intellectual exercise, I think. Mm. And here are we academising about comedy, which is the very thing I'm saying we shouldn't do. <laughs> so I think you've either got it or you haven't. Can I ask you about the Mint on ITV? Well, do, do you remember a, much about it? No, not a lot. <laughs> I, had to go, I, went, I, was, I was blown away. It went on at midnight. There's this girl on and a guy. Uh, and they were just... And the, the quizzes. It was quizzes. Uh, name, name seven uh, phobias. And if you, if you could name them... Uh, you got 50, 100, 2,000, whatever, pounds. And, uh, and this girl's on it, and uh, she's no script. And she's there for four hours. I said, what, what are you, you going to what are you, what are you do for I said, just talk. <laughs> I said, what are you going to talk? She said, talk about the question. Come on now, ring in, it's 2,000 pounds. Have we got, no, we have some more phobias left, and we've got the, give us a number for this. And she's getting deliveries down her ear, said, right, mention again, mention the star prize. And I sat. This lot. And I went on about 20 past 12. She, I said, when do I go off? She said, well, the hooter will go. <laughs> I said, what does that mean? She said, your taxi's arrived. <laughs> so I just sat talking to her, like we are now. But that's yeah. all, that was it. Just about anything. So, a lovely girl. I did it twice. Um, modern telly. But, whoa, risky. Yes. Risky. And it makes a fortune. Phone call. Yeah, Don't the phone call. Don't ring calls, in too yeah. often. Don't ring in. If you're listening, if you ring the mint, just allocate yourself to one call a week. Otherwise, your credit card will melt. That's how they got a lot of money on these top oh, shows, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, they do now. Any, any. I mean, this is not this is not to discourage you from ringing in because I know a lot of you do. It's a great therapy for you to do that, and most of the calls are fifteen pence. They're a bit of fun. I mean, deal or no deal. If you've watched that with with Noel Edmonds, the prize to give to the public started at one thousand, two thousand, and three thousand pounds. It's now five thousand some days, ten thousand, and twenty five thousand pounds. They're giving back to the viewer. That's how much he's making. Mm. So. That should be telling you something out there, folks. <laughs> Looking back then on, on a fantastic career for you, what have been the highlights for you, really? Bullseye, obviously, because it made you a, such a household name, didn't it, really? Do you know, John, I, I think the, it would be ungracious of me to pick out a highlight because looking back over the whole thing, I think the whole thing has been just, just one big laugh. Phenomenal laugh. Mm. Not too many... Grief-ridden moments. I don't think any grief-ridden moments. And to be able to say that after 35 years in this business means that you've been an extremely fortunate person. And to say anything anything other than thank you very much would be crass. Mm. I don't reckon you've ever changed. I reckon you're just the same as you were when you were a school teacher or when you first started in the business, because it hadn't affected you, has it? I think I like to think not. I came into it fairly late, which was good. You see, I came in, into it when I was in my late 30s when I'd grown up a little bit, I was still a plank until I was 45. I was still, but I always tried to be, and still do now, what you see is what you get. And it's not because it's being clever, it's just because it's the easiest way out. Because you constantly, you don't have to put a front on like when you came today, what you, this is what you get. There's no point creating an ego. I think the biggest killer to a, to a man's career can be his ego. Mm. Ask Simon D. Yes. Um, so don't have an ego because you're a lucky guy to be earning the sort of money I earn and these people here will have to work for, well, a long time mm. to get what I get in a night. So to, 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 to be ungrateful about that or even to dismiss it and not be aware of how lucky you are is, is the height of ingratitude, I really do. I look on you as one of the, the few real legends still working. There's a few of you around and really? it's great. We're not aware of being legends, although people very graciously do say we are. And it's like Tom and like Frank. Um, I suppose you become a legend almost by default, by just being there. Not that you're all that good necessarily, 
and not that you're all that impacted, but it's just that you're still there and not causing too much grief. You know, and if you can go in on the back of a game show like I did, and Carson can go back in on the back of an Irish accent and a will to live <laughs> yes. like he does, and a voice to last forever. You know, somebody once said to me, I was talking to Frank Carson last night, I said, no, you were, you were listening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I think it's just been one happy adventure. So is it great thrill to talk to you because, uh, well, <laughs> you're just nice to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice of you. <laughs> Lots of luck in the future. Thank you, John. It's great. He's got a swell personality. He meets and greets the stars with such amenity. Good enough to make you coming out of the street. John Hanna That's right. Well, that was super smashing great, wasn't it? Jim Bowen here, just reminding you, you've been listening to John Hannum on Isle of Wight Radio. Happy memories of a lovely guy. Today we've been celebrating the life of Jim Bowen, who died in early 2018. Keep looking on the Isle of Wight Radio website, the John Hannum website and YouTube for more John Hannum Meets new interviews. Bye-bye for now. Isle of Wight Radio.